This formally classified letter, written by General Nathan Twining, was the result of numerous UFO sightings by Air Force pilots, such as Colonel Stevens described. Concerning flying disc reports, General Twining states, and we quote, the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. There are objects, probably approximately the shape of a disc, of such appreciable size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft. The reported operating characteristics, such as extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, must be considered evasive when sighted. Some of the objects are controlled either manually, automatically, or remotely. The apparent common description of the object is as follows. Metallic or light reflecting surface, circular or elliptical in shape, flat on the bottom and domed on the top. End quote. This report makes it abundantly clear that the United States military knew of the reality of flying saucers and deliberately kept it a secret. Some military people, like retired Marine Major Donald Keogh, spoke out, accusing the government of hiding what it knows about UFOs. This is not an attack on the Air Force spokesman or the project spokesman. They are simply following orders to explain away all UFO sightings as quickly as possible when they become public and deny that UFOs really exist. So you've been briefed on on uh, on the fact that that there are we've been visited. Well, I have briefed it one word for it. I, I have been involved in in uh, uh, much of this work. Uh, no, it's not my main work. It's not my main interest. But I have been deeply involved in certain committees and certain research programs with very credible scientists and very uh, intelligence people that uh, do know the real inside story. And I I am not. Uh, hesitant to talk about it. What is the real inside story? Well, I've just been telling you. We have been visited. The Roswell crash was real, and a uh, number of other contacts have been real and ongoing. Uh, it's pretty well known to for, for, for those of us who have um, been briefed and have been close to the subject matter. The question of extraterrestrial life has puzzled people for decades. Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, he was the sixth man to walk on the moon, and he says he's certain we are not alone in the universe. He's now speaking out about why he thinks the government actually knows this to be true. Former astronaut and scientist Dr. Edgar Mitchell is one of 12 men to have walked on the moon. I did grow up in Roswell, New Mexico, which was the site of the so-called Roswell incident and uh, was living there at the time that happened, even though there was a great deal of uh, keep people quiet from the government, uh, the lore of, for many years was that it was a UFO crash. July 1947, a mysterious explosion rocked Roswell, New Mexico. Strange debris was recovered from the scene. This is an actual bulletin of the time. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. At first, the government said the mysterious object was a, quote, flying disc, but later explained that it was just a top-secret research balloon. However, locals and UFO enthusiasts adamantly believe that what really crashed that night was an alien spacecraft. Adding to the intrigue is a deathbed admission from a public information officer on the case who said it was not only a government cover-up, but that bodies of space aliens were recovered from the site. Because I was a Roswell boy, a local person, and also I had the credibility of uh, uh, going into space and going to the moon, some of the locals came to me and some of the, a couple of military and intelligence people came to me. They wanted to tell their story uh, because they couldn't tell it. They were sworn to secrecy. But why aren't UFO research findings reported to the public? Given all the government secrecy, Dr. Mitchell says he isn't surprised that people are afraid to report their stories to authorities. Knowing many other military aviators when, who have had encounters with UFOs in, in the air and tried to talk about it. They were always debriefed by intelligence people and then told to shut up and don't say anything. But Dr. Mitchell is, quote, not the only astronaut to question the existence of extraterrestrial life. 
and the late Gordon Cooper, one of the original seven Mercury astronauts, was also convinced we're not alone. One of the themes of his memoir, quote, Leap of Faith, is his belief in extraterrestrial intelligence. When he was at uh, Edwards Air Force Base on duty before his selection, there was a UFO incident there that he observed, uh, got some pictures of, and tried to report it, and did report it, but his pictures disappeared. Recently, Yolanda Gaskin spoke with Gordon Cooper. In this exclusive interview, Colonel Cooper spoke for the first time on television about his encounters with UFOs. While supervising flight testing in Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew actually filmed an unidentified saucer-shaped object landing near the site. As they were sitting there filming, a little saucer came from, uh, I say little saucer, it was a saucer, came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed. And they picked up their cameras and started over toward it, filming as they went. And when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in the wheel wells, tipped up and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they brought the, came into my office and told me what had happened and I sent them over to develop the film. And then had to go through the, all the proper regulations of reporting this and, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the uh, base jet airplane. And, uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since. Now, the vehicle that you just described, how similar was it to the very first sighting that you had back in 1951? Quite similar. It was basically the same plan form vehicle. They were a double saucer, lenticular. Years later, Cooper approached the United Nations with a proposal for a committee that would explore the UFO phenomenon. Right now, tell me about the letter to the UN. Well, the letter to the UN was uh, in conjunction with a meeting that I had with uh, Kurt Waldheim and the Security Council of the UN to try to encourage the UN to establish a committee to start comparing notes and data and information and to really look into all of this from an unbiased, neutral point of view. Here's a quote from, from your letter. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. And are you saying that's exactly why governments have been trying to keep this information private because of that obvious advancement? Very possibly. Right. Now, a former CIA pilot is about to confirm Lazar's story and steps forward with a shocking sighting of his own. Bill is uncovering new information about the purported function of Element 115 from a man who Bob Lazar confided in. His name is John Lear. John's father invented the Learjet. John himself is an accomplished pilot. He worked for the CIA, had a very high security clearance. Lear retired with more than 19,000 hours of flight time. He holds the most FAA airman certificates ever earned by a single pilot. But his entire life changed when he developed a close personal friendship with Bob Lazar back in the late 1980s. According to Lear, Lazar used to take him on late night excursions to the outskirts of Area 51 to watch flying saucer tests. You saw a flying saucer at Area no 51. No doubt about it. I saw a flying saucer. It was radiating yellow and gold. Bob Lazar told me when it was going to be there, and it was there. In never-before-seen home video from March 22, 1989, John Lear is shown here on the perimeter of Area 51, also referred to as Groom Lake. The voice of the man holding the camera is Bob Lazar. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Moon Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, <clears throat> seven or eight minutes. The mission was organized tonight uh, by Bob Lazar, who is a, uh, a, um, a theoretical physicist who works at Groom Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and is also a dead man at this point. <laughs> South of a dry lake bed known as Area 51 is a place known as S-4, allegedly home to a super-secret government research facility. 
In the course of our investigation, we found a scientist who says he used to work there. Robert Lazar was shocked when he first discovered what it was he would be working on. Got out of the bus, I was told to walk directly through the hangar, and uh, immediately, uh, even before entering the hangar, you can see the edge of a disc. Uh, this is your classic flying saucer, two inverted pie plates, if you wish, uh, with a segmented larger area dome on top. Within minutes of that, I finally realized that this had nothing to do with something the government was producing. And it was quite shocking because everything inside was small. This is a full-size craft, 30, 35 feet in diameter, maybe 40. Uh, but you're looking at, at uh, seats that are, you know, 18 inches off the ground, obviously made you know, for, for something smaller. It certainly wasn't made for children to play in. Lazar says there were nine spaceships in all, and he claims to have seen one fly. It began to lift off the ground almost silently. There was a hiss sound, uh, like a corona discharge, if you hear around high voltage systems, uh, accompanied by a faint, it probably would have been brighter at, at night, a faint uh, blue glow around the bottom as the craft approached about 30 feet, 20 feet, something like that off the ground. Uh, that corona discharge disappeared, uh, the sound stopped, and the craft stood there silently and uh, slowly drifted over to the left and then to the right. The government denies they're testing alien craft at S-4. Lazar no longer works there and nowadays spends his time working on one of his hobbies, jet car racing. He alleges that after he went public, security officers at the base threatened his life. He also says that his employment and military service records have disappeared. Despite repeated requests, the government can't find them. The subcontractor who hired him for the job at S-4 refuses to comment. But a few clues support Lazar's contention that he is a scientist and that he has worked for the government. This W-2 form indicates that he had been employed by the Department of Naval Intelligence. Before his stint at S-4, Lazar claims to have worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Los Alamos officials can't find any record of him but his name does appear in a laboratory phone book from that time. Reporter George Knapp was able to track down a few of Lazar's colleagues who could confirm parts of his story. But when they talked to Knapp, something strange happened. One after another had, had visits from, from government personnel who basically intimidated or told them to back off, followed them around. There didn't have to be any direct communication where an agent says, you keep talking to this guy, you're gonna end up in a river. The message was very clear. I've been covering organized crime in Las Vegas for, for 10 years, dealing with uh, mob hitmen and mob informants, uh, people who have been in the witness protection program. The fear that is generated by this UFO subject for people who really know about it far outweighs the kind of fear that the mob inspires. I mean, people are more afraid of our government than they are of organized crime. I am exactly sure of what I saw. I know what mainstream science is like. I know what, where physics stands. I know all of that. And this is an extraterrestrial craft. This technology is hundreds and hundreds of years in advance of us. And that's the end of that story. Some of the information is very disturbing. Um, it changes the way you view things. It changes the way you look at everything. Once this, once it hits you, what really is going on? And uh, I think the government could be right in a sense that, that if the story came out in its entirety, if the president went on television and said, they're here, we can't do anything about it, that it would shake our foundations. It would shake our belief in religion and shake our belief in, in government. Maybe people would stop paying their taxes because it would change the way we view everything. It's changed my life. I, I mean, I'm not seeing God or anything, but uh, uh, it's changed the way I view things. Most controversial in Knapp's UFO report was the story of this young scientist, Robert Lazar. Lazar claims that out in the Las Vegas desert, he worked on operational flying saucers at an area called Site 4. He says it's our country's number one top secret. I had a casual meeting with uh, Dr. Edward Teller uh, while working at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. He referred me after several years uh, to a job out in the New Mexico desert, uh, a place known as S-4 near Area 51, uh, where many uh, uh, top secret government projects uh, had their home base, essentially. Edward Teller is the director of the program, uh, and I think 
someone approved by, by Ed Teller, someone suggested by him, uh, I think that carries enough weight in itself. I, I had a fascination with uh, small jet engines. I had built uh, and installed a, a jet engine in a little Honda Civic, a small car. Uh, it made the front page in the local Los Alamos paper, The Monitor. Uh, coincidentally, and in fact on the back of that, that front page, uh, Ed Teller was giving a lecture on SDI, and I believe that was June 1982, uh, at Los Alamos. Uh, as I was walking up to the lecture hall, I, I wanted to hear what Ed Teller had to say. As I was walking up to the lecture hall, I got there relatively early, thinking there would be a fairly large turnout, and as it turned out, there wasn't. Um, I got there about an hour and a half early, and Ed Teller is sitting outside uh, and he had just bought a paper out of the paper machine and he was reading the front page and I thought, well, what an opportunity to introduce myself. I can say, well, I'm the guy you're reading about. I always wanted to meet you, so on and so forth. Uh, just to get into some small talk. Uh, we talked for a little bit. Uh, he seemed interested in, in uh, some things I had to say and really just wanted to hear his viewpoints on, on certain things. And we had a cup of coffee together and a donut uh, down at the cafeteria. Uh, that was the extent of our meeting after that. I, I heard his lecture and uh, later after I had moved to Las Vegas, uh, when I decided to get back into the scientific field and sent out resumes to many other uh, uh, laboratories around the country, uh, also uh, any government research organizations, I did shoot a resume to Ed Teller too. He called right after receiving it and said, uh, I had directed your resume to someone in Nevada uh, it's a highly classified project, and they'll be requesting an interview. Within 20 minutes, the phone rang. That was the request for the interview. So obviously, Ed Teller w gave it more than a nudge. It was more like a directive that this person will be interviewed for this particular job, and that's the bottom line. So yeah, he, he did get me into the program. In you know early 1989, I was already in the program and, and, and working at a, at a slow pace because at the same time, uh, I had to go through uh, an extensive security investigation that was like no other I had been through before. I had Q clearance from Los Alamos, and this was something far above it, uh, which I was told was 38 levels above Q clearance. Uh, it required an, an executive order to be signed at that time. At that time, that executive order was signed by uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, the program, I was only in the program for a short time, however, I think that lasted all the way till April. 1989 when uh, we finally parted ways and you know there's a whole story behind that initially during the interviews it was never specifically stated hey bob we're going to be working on flying saucers or alien craft recovered from crashes or recovered from wherever um, the uh, job title was a senior staff physicist i was to be working on advanced propulsion techniques certainly when i made a few trips out there, began reading briefings, things dealing with the origin of the craft, uh, the, uh, the race or the type of aliens that piloted the craft, uh, specifics on uh, what, what these looked like, uh, what their physical structure was from autopsy reports, things of this sort. Seeing the hardware, I realized that this is not a research effort, that this is back engineering and that we have the device, the craft itself, and we are working backwards to find out how it works. They have the finished product and really want to find out the manufacturing technique, the basic physics in it, and uh, it became very obvious what we're working on. But it was strange that even up till the very end, there really no words were, were said about what was going on. The time I saw the craft, a uh, large disc flying saucer, typical flying saucer, um, even that, I basically put out of my mind thinking, well, this obviously is a creation uh, of the government, some sort of advanced type of flying vehicle, maybe an advanced fighter of the future. Uh, and this explains all those crazy flying saucer stories, uh, you know, people just seeing tests of this craft. Uh, the real striking part was when I saw the interior of the craft and noticing that the seats and everything was, were extremely small, obviously made for a small creature or or children obviously they wouldn't let children in there but uh and it, that was before i got heavy into it to see that uh you know we're talking about strange languages and things and technology that doesn't even exist and so on and so forth the information 
concerning the craft itself, just the hardware, is very compartmentalized. There's a, a group that deals with specifics on the navigational equipment, the specifics on the metallurgy of the craft, and the specifics on the propulsion and, and power system of the craft, which is what, what my group worked on. Um, that in itself created a focal point for uh, our research and, and looking in, into what you know, we were dealing with. Uh, so I, in a short amount of time, because that was all we had to look at, uh, really gained quite a bit of information on how things operated. Uh, of course, verifying the employment there is somewhat difficult. Los Alamos denies I have ever worked there, as does Kirk Meyer, even the subcontractor for Los Alamos. Uh, which is interesting. We went back and were able to dig up uh, an inner lab directory phone book with my name in it. Uh, certainly I got some of my colleagues from Los Alamos to verify that I work there, but for the most part Los Alamos has kept everything pretty quiet and even denies that uh, I ever lived in the town, though I'm known by many people in the town and many of the people I worked with, supervisors, so on and so forth. When Lazar went to trial on unrelated charges in 1990, even the judge agreed that Lazar seemed to be a man without a country. We do have a W-2 form of record uh, that uh, shows that he worked for the United States Department of Naval Intelligence. And uh, I also note that he is in fact listed in the Los Alamos National Laboratory Telephone Directory. It's obvious that it's very difficult to get information on Mr. Lazar uh, from government sources. Uh, enormously difficult. Lazar claims a university education, but gives no hard evidence. Bob wouldn't be the first person in history to lie about his education in order to get a job. But the only records that he went to school anywhere is one electronics course at a junior college. And it doesn't make sense that someone with that level of education would get hired to work at the places where he worked. Fairchild Industries in a highly technical position and later Los Alamos in a highly technical position. He had to get educated somewhere. If you've been to his house, if you see what he does with computers, you know he's a, as an intelligent and educated man. Where did that education come from? But proof of Lazar's employment at S4 and at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he reportedly worked prior to Area 51, seems to disappear. He claims his identity is being erased. And many dismiss him as a fraud. But Knapp finds something shocking in the Los Alamos lab records. We called the lab. They said, no, he wasn't here. We don't have any record of him. And then we found the lab phone book with his name in it. I called him back. I said, well, there it is. Ah, well, we still don't have any records. Was the government trying to hide that Lazar had ever been working at Area 51? So then we, I, I got the uh, newspaper article, Los Alamos Monitor. There he is on the front page and a, a picture of him with his jet car, and it lists him as a physicist. I went back to the lab. Nah, we don't have anything for him. And I know he was there, not only because of the, the phone book and the newspaper article, but because I've interviewed four or five people who worked with him there who said he was there working on classified projects. With strong proof that Lazar worked at Los Alamos, Knapp believes there's credence to his claims. Now, a former CIA pilot is about to confirm Lazar's story and steps forward with a shocking sighting of his own. Bill is uncovering new information about the purported function of Element 115 from a man who Bob Lazar confided in. His name is John Lear. John's father invented the Learjet. John himself is an accomplished pilot. He worked for the CIA, had a very high security clearance. Lear retired with more than 19,000 hours of flight time. He holds the most FAA airman certificates ever earned by a single pilot. But his entire life changed when he developed a close personal friendship with Bob Lazar back in the late 1980s. According to Lear, Lazar used to take him on late night excursions to the outskirts of Area 51 to watch flying saucer tests. You saw a flying saucer at Area no 51. No doubt about it. I saw a flying saucer. It was radiating yellow and gold. Bob Lazar told me when it was going to be there, and it was there. In never before seen home video from March 22, 1989, John Lear is shown here on the perimeter of Area 51, also referred to as Groom Lake. The voice of the man holding the camera 
is Bob Lazar. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Moon Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, <clears throat> seven or eight minutes. The mission was organized tonight uh, by Bob Lazar, who is a, uh, a, um, a theoretical physicist who works at Groom Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and is also a dead man at this point. <laughs> Good evening, this is John Lear, and today is March 22nd, 1989. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Groom Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, <clears throat> seven or eight minutes. Right here, I have my Celestron scope, uh, it's eight uh, inches. And I had, uh, I had it focused in for about 15 seconds and saw for myself that, in fact, it was a disc. <clears throat> We're going to uh, uh, stay here for another couple hours here to see if we can show you folks uh, an actual uh, extraterrestrial flying saucer being uh, flown by the government. So if you just stand by, and uh, we'll be looking over that mountain, which is where they are. They also come over here, which is over at Bald Mountain. There's some lights over there which you can't see, but there are a number of trucks. We don't know whether they're looking down here or <clears throat> what they're doing up there, but we managed to get in here. Uh, we're standing on public land. It's uh, completely legal where we are. And if you'd like to uh, come here later in the show, we'll tell you exactly how to get here. Well, you can mention who's with you, John. Uh, we have Bob Lazar, and we have um, Jackie uh, Lazar, Bob's wife, and we have Gene Huff. And this mission was organized tonight. Uh, by Bob Lazar, who is a, uh, a, uh, a theoretical physicist who works at Groom Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and is also a dead man at this point. <laughs> We're having this on film that he wrote yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> you want your name on there that you're a yeah. We're out here with the late Bob Lazar. <laughs> Now, we weren't in the base. We were still 10 miles away from it. But even out at that far, there was still a reasonable amount of security. And uh, we were able to see quite a few things. And uh, as time went on, we became lax and eventually got caught. The day after I was caught, I was supposed to show up for work. However, they had me debriefed at uh, an Air Force base north of Las Vegas. That's where a lot of the friction began between myself and the people there. They uh, pointed weapons at me, yelling in my face at a close distance. I mean, they were as angry as you could be without hurting someone. They threatened my life. At the time, they threatened my wife's life. Past employment records, places I've been, places I've worked, people I had worked with, all this information began to disappear, and I actually began to be concerned that perhaps they were going to do the same to me. I thought it became necessary to see one of the people on a local news station because I thought if it went on the news, they couldn't make me completely disappear. It would look very suspicious if all of a sudden this person, you know, released these claims and then he disappeared himself. So that was, it was kind of an insurance policy for me. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine, uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. After Lazar broke the story on the spacecraft, he was arrested and charged with pandering, helping to run a brothel in Las Vegas. When Bob came and told me that he was involved on the outskirts of this illegal brothel operation, I saw my professional life flash before my eyes. I was very upset. I had uh, written and developed a computer system so a local brothel could run efficiently in town, and uh, that is, in effect, against the law. And I eventually convinced him, we have to break this story. You can't let somebody else do it because it will come out. That may have been a mistake from a legal standpoint for him, but I think it was important. And strange for a little case like that, that there'd be FBI personnel and things like that at the hearing. So was there a push on to uh, create a, a lot more fear than necessary? Sure, I'm positive there was. They looked at that as something to discredit me. I think the government does know. Barry Goldwater, senator, presidential candidate, and believer. I can't back that up. 
But I think that uh, at Wright Patterson Field, if you could get into certain places, you'd find out what the Air Force and the government knows about UFOs. From his ham radio shack outside Phoenix, the senator disclaims direct knowledge of UFOs, but he does confirm a disturbing story about an exchange with General Curtis LeMay. Reportedly, a spaceship landed. And it was all hushed up, quieted, and nobody ever, I've never heard about much of it. I called Curtis LeMay and I said, General, uh, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson, where you put all this secret stuff. Can I go in there? I've never heard him get mad, but he got madder than hell at me, cussed me out, said, don't ever ask me that question again. 